Hello, and thank you for joining the World Alliance for Arts Education to celebrate International Arts Education Week. The need for arts education and the UN Sustainable Development Goals will be hosted by Patrick Cabanda and Tricia Tunstall. On behalf of the World Alliance for Arts Education, we thank you again for attending this webinar and we hope to see you online throughout International Arts Education Week. Now, please welcome the speakers and hosts of today's webinar, Patrick Cabanda and Trisha Tunstall. Welcome. In two important global communities. One is the International Arts Educators Community. That's you and us. And the other community is the International Sustainable Development Community, which might be people that you and I don't know so well, but we believe that the interconnections between these two communities are potentially very powerful. And so we're going to explore them today with you. These are the goals of our webinar today. There are mainly three. The first is to explore the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, their evolution, their current purposes and uses. Secondly, we want to explore why and how arts education can powerfully contribute to the achievement of the SDGs. And third, it's a call for partnerships between arts educators and governments, NGOs, corporate institutions, whereby arts education can help to drive sustainable development. Let's start with a brief explanation of these 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs as they're often called. I'm sure that many of you know about them already. Some of you may have heard of them, but are not exactly sure what they are. But our uh, aim is that by the end of this webinar, you'll be very, all of you will be very familiar with them. So take a minute to look through them. The, these goals were established by the United Nations General Assembly in 2015 in New York. They were meant by their creators to express an urgent conviction that all of them need to be achieved by 2030. And they were also meant to be understood as interdependent, which means that all of them need to be achieved in connection with one another in order that no one on earth be left behind. So often big pronouncements like this are received with a lot of fanfare, but then nobody really does anything about them. That's not true of the SDGs. In fact, these 17 goals have been adopted by organizations and institutions that actually drive development around the world. And they're taking them on as their own goals and they're putting money and muscle into efforts to achieve them. So that's why I think that we as arts educators need to know about them and really understand them. Because if there is one thing that you and I know, it's that arts education can help a lot to achieve a lot of these goals. You'll notice that, there are not, that there's not one goal, uh, one individual box that's dedicated to arts and culture. And I actually think that this is a good thing because I think that what we do as arts educators and artists uh, are too important to be contained in one of these boxes, but really can serve as drivers and accelerators for all of the 17 goals. This is a fairly new idea, but it's one that's beginning to gain a lot of traction. And in fact, I'd like to give you one quote that shows that only two days ago, UNESCO celebrated the beginning of this week, International Arts Education Week, by saying the following, arts education enhances in a cross-cutting manner the achievement of the sustainable development goals, particularly Number four on quality education. Number five on gender equality. Number eight on, ex on enhancing opportunities for decent work and employment. And also conflict mitigation and peace building in the spirit of the SDGs, number 16. So I think you and I are going to explore those and many more possible connections along with Patrick. And at this point, I would like to ask my distinguished colleague, Patrick Cabanda, to take us more deeply into some of these ideas. Patrick. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Teresa, uh, for the introduction. And also, I want to take this opportunity to thank Jeff for inviting us, uh, as well as the Wild Alliance for Arts Education. And I want to thank you, um, 
all of you for joining us uh, during this important week celebrating arts education. So now um, I must immediately note that SDGs, as many of you may be aware, are not perfect. Uh, but even though they are not perfect, they can contribute to the framing and addressing of some of our most pressing issues of our time. On the very first goal, for example, it's increasingly clear that poverty is not just a problem of poor countries. Which countries, like the United States, also have a shocking share of this problem in unimaginable proportions. But what's the role of arts education in addressing poverty? These goals, as Teresa just mentioned, are interlinked, and education is important in achieving them. But if goal number four is about quality education, what kind of quality education is this? And where do the arts come in? Leonardo da Vinci, who we're going to talk about shortly, didn't come from a so-called good family. So he was left to wonder and was largely self-taught. What if he was forced to cram for standardized tests? I bet we probably won't have seen his many contributions running from the arts to the sciences. As we talk more about this on the next slide, we are going to consider the concepts of human capital and human capability. Uh, the term human capital is widely used and I'm sure a number of you have heard it. But human capability, which may be less familiar, is often associated with the work of the American philosopher Martha Nussbaum and the Indian economist and philosopher Amartya Sen, not to mention many other scholars who have contributed to its development. Human capital and human capability are interrelated. But as Sen goes on to say, at the risk of some of our simplification, it can be said that the literature on human capital tends to concentrate on the urgency of human beings in argumenting production possibilities as if people are meant to be robots just to serve the economy. But of course, the benefits of education are not just about community production and human capital argumentation. And that's where human capability comes in. It comes in because it considers human beings in a broader perspective, a perspective that accommodates arts education. Consider the following quote by the Vietnamese American novelist, Viet Nguyen, and please forgive me if I've mispronounced his name. Sometimes people ask me what it takes to be a writer. The only things you have to do, I tell them, are read constantly, write for thousands of hours, and have a masochistic ability to absorb a great deal of rejection. As it turns out, these qualities have prepared me well to deal with life in the time of the coronavirus. I think that's a wonderful example of um, human capability. Um, so the next slide, we are going to talk about um, the arts and innovation and how play uh, leads to creativity. Now, play leads to creativity partly because it triggers intellect and imagination, yet it's also about breaking rules and not so much about cram work. So for example, um, you can read more about this from the book, uh, the, the book called Wonderland, How Play Made the Modern World by Stephen Johnson. And in that example, uh, Stephen, and that book, uh, Stephen Johnson has many, many examples, but I want to pick one um, by the Banu Musa brothers and their hydraulic organ called the instrument which plays by itself. 
That instrument is actually the genesis of software and hardware. Uh, so the Banu Musa brothers were toy designers who lived in what today is called Iraq. Their hydraulic organ was similar in design to Greek and Roman instruments built centuries before, but theirs was different in that it employed a new future. Its notes were not triggered by human fingers on a keyboard, but by a pinned cylinder, a barrel with small teeth. And later on, I will show you a picture of um, what this organ would have looked like. The cylinder could be swapped out and encoded with new information to play different sounds when placed back in the organ. These brothers were associated with the House of Wisdom, a kind of think tank for engineers and tinkers in 800 AD when Baghdad was the center of global wisdom. And their instrument, which plays by itself, believe it or not, was the genesis for programmability and the difference between software and hardware. As Johnson explains, it introduced important concepts of the digital age more than thousands of years before the first computers were built. So if we talk about programming, cutting melody and coding, we have these brothers to thank. And of course, play was so important to them. <laughs> Um, and then um, the next example we're going to look at is uh, the name we are so familiar with, and that will be um, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, Leonardo da Vinci takes us to Italy, but most of us know him very well as a painter, but he was also an architect, an inventor, and a student of all things scientific. As history, dot com notes his natural genius crossed many disciplines um, and in that uh, today you know i think he epitomizes the term renaissance man and he remains best known for his art including two paintings that remain among the most famous and admired the mona lisa and the last supper art da vinci believed was indisputably connected with science and nature. Largely self-educated, as I mentioned earlier, he peeled dozens of secret notebooks with inventions, observations, and theories about pursuits from aeronautics to anatomy. The combination of his intellect and imagination allowed him to create, at least on paper, such inventions as the bicycle, the helicopter, an airplane based on the physiology and flying capability of a bat. Now, I'm glad here they use the word capability and not capacity, but it also shows that bats have many things to teach us, not just um, being a source of viruses like the corona, which is really <laughs> bringing us a lot of um, troubles now. And next example I will talk about is a certain poll. Um, so Tungpo uh, lived in ancient China, and again, forgive me if I didn't pronounce his name correctly. Uh, he was a much beloved governor of Hanzong. He was a poet, a painter, and a skilled engineer. His best known project was a causeway that traversed Westlake and still does today, according to Eric Weiner, author of the book called The Geography of Genius. But as Weiner says, this is what's likely to happen if certain Po walked onto a, mod a modern college campus today, and we are assuming no lockdowns because of the coronavirus. Is it Rushicha that interests you in, that you're interested in, Mr. Su? Then please see the School of Humanities. Oh, you're a painter. Please drop by the Department of Finance. What's that? It's engineering that bequeaths your interest. We have an excellent school for that too. But I want to do it all. I'm sorry, Mr. So. We can't help you there. Please return when you've clarified your career objectives. Meanwhile, 
if you like, I can direct you to mental health services. This is indeed what's likely to happen today in our culture that celebrates standardized states and the like and neglects the arts. Yet, uh, we need multidisciplinary thinking, we need many subjects to get to come together, we need polymath to address the challenges we are facing because the problems themselves tend to be cross cutting as we see today. You can't really decouple uh, public health from the economic problems we are facing because of the virus now engulfing the world. So on the next slide, I want to show you um, a picture of that organ I talked about, uh, which is a reconstruction of ba the Banu Musa brother self-playing music automation. It looks like that. And on the link there, you can go and read more about it. And at this point, I will turn it back uh, to Tricia. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Patrick has given us some extraordinary examples of individuals throughout history who haven't seen any conflict between art on the one hand and science, technology, engineering on the other hand, but in fact, their artistic accomplishments and their artistic um, abilities made it possible for them to help achieve breakthroughs in sociology and economics and technology. So uh, inspired by that, uh, I would like to go on and give you some examples of programs in the modern world that are fusing arts education and social change. And let me take a moment before I begin to remind you, if you have comments, if you have questions, please write them in the chat box now. I think there's already a lively conversation going on there and we want to encourage that. So please um, jot down your thoughts in the chat box and hopefully we will all get to discuss them before we finish. So back to this picture, in the course of doing some research over the last decade, I have learned that there are literally hundreds of programs around the world that are doing music education projects and for, social, for social change purposes. And so that is the area of arts education that I know best. So I'm going to take my first few examples from the sphere of arts education, uh, of, of music education, sorry. In, in many places that I visited, the music education programs looked very much like this, under a nearby tree or in a cr crowded town plaza or really anywhere that children and their instruments could gather and make music. All of these programs were inspired by the idea that music education could transform not only children in underserved communities, but also their families and their communities. So the word inclusion is always critical here because when children are invited to belong to a cooperative venture and feel that they are valued, that is the moment that social change really can begin. This slide is an example of inclu inclusion-based music education. It's called the White Hands Chorus and it combines deaf children with children who are differently abled in other ways but can hear and the deaf children use their white gloved hands to communicate the essence of the words that are being sung by the other children in the chorus. The effect of the entire ensemble all singing together is indescribably moving and it's exactly because it's so inclusive. This is something that was developed in El Sistema in Venezuela in the 1990s and has since become uh, something that's an idea that's gone around the world. White Hands Choruses now exist in many, many places. And now what does this have to do, you may ask, with the SDGs? Inclusive music learning actually contributes to sustainable development goal number 10. When children are welcomed into an environment that, that values them and every single person has a chance to become a participant and become included and become valuable and necessary, then the then the inequality between children in terms of what they can do musically is erased. As we all know, many in many countries around the world, there's a vast inequality of, in terms of opportunity for quality music education. And so these programs erase that inequality 
and make it possible for everyone to start out with a basis in rich, compelling music education and so that everyone can be included. So it really is very relevant this, to this very concrete goal, reduced inequalities. This photo shows children of the music program called Superar here in Vienna. They come from many, many different ethnic and linguistic backgrounds. When children make music together like this, it makes it much more difficult for families and ethnic groups to remain in tension and conflict. And it really paves the way towards resolution of conflict in many ways. I have seen this in action in country after country in, in uh, Vienna, but also in Italy and Sweden, Bosnia, Romania, Colombia. I saw communities that were divided by decades of conflict come together around the children's musical program. So this is a powerful con co uh, contribution to the SDG number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Many kinds of arts education, not only music, but also drama and spoken word, dance, and others can contribute to con conflict resolution. To take one example that I think is particularly important, let's think about Colombia, where there is a program called Batuta, in uh, the 1990s, it began to address the problems of children in refugee camps during the Civil War. That program was so successful in doing that, that it continues today, funded by federal government and municipal gov governments alike in Colombia, because they are sure, they're convinced, that having children make music together makes a very strong deterrent to gang warfare and to violence of all times. So dance education also can be effective in many ways that are similar to music education if it's practiced as inclusive and ensemble and it prioritizes accessibility to all, for all. How you wonder may dance education though, may, may be, how may it be thought of as activism? It is indeed activism because like all arts education, dance is capable of framing and dramatizing urgent civic imperatives. The photo you just saw shows a dancer performing in the Museum of Natural History in New York, a dance called On the Nature of Things by the dancer choreographer Carol Armitage. The dance was performed along with a narration by Paul Ehrlich, a scientist and climate change activist. And it was a passionate expression of protest against climate change, against a background in the museum of the polar bears, the walruses, the animals that are slated for extinction because of climate change. So the choreographer's idea here was that sometimes people are not moved by scientific truths, but can in fact be moved by an artistic expression that goes straight to visceral emotion. And in fact, they can be moved to action. So in that way, dance education, like music education, can be used as a force uh, toward climate action. Uh, here's one final example I want to give you, this one from the visual arts. This photo is from a remarkable program in Philadelphia called the Village of Arts and Humanities. What happens is over, the, over a number of years in an economically devastated area of North Philadelphia, this project expanded over 260 square blocks of vibrant visual arts and cultural arts all of them created by the people who live there, many of them students, and many of them in the course of educational projects. The Village of Arts and Humanities was so beautiful. It was so aesthetically engaging and so vibrant with creative youth energy that it has over the years attracted businesses, more residents and visitors, sometimes tourists. So as a result, it has actually become more economically viable healthier and sustainable. So in this way, a visual arts project uh, directly and specifically um, contributed to the SDG number 11, sustainable cities and communities. So in summary, across the, state, across the United States, across the world, there's a really interesting confluence that's beginning to go on between arts educators in, in one hand, and especially the community center arts and culture movement, which prioritizes co social cohesion through the arts. 
And on the other hand, the sustainable development movement, which brings a racial and an economic equity lens to the development of cities and communities everywhere. And the confluence of these two is where there is an enormous amount of heat, light, and potential energy. And that's what we're here to emphasize with you today and to imagine what this could turn into. So you might remember that our third and last goal in this webinar was to call for partnerships between arts educators and governments, NGOs, and corporate institutions, whereby arts education can actually help to drive sustainable development. Here's the question. As arts educators, how can we reframe our work to position ourselves for partnership with institutions that are committed to achieving the SDGs? How can we reframe our work to position ourselves for partnership with these institutions? So I want to emphasize what the question is not. It's not a call for changing what we do as arts educators, because I think we should absolutely persevere in what we do, do it more and harder than ever. But instead, it's how can we reframe what we, how we think about it and sometimes how we talk about it so that we are more alive and available to the kinds of partnerships we're talking about. And when I say think differently and speak differently about it, I mean think more ambitiously about it. It means we need to be saying, yes, my work does directly affect the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. So this means here are a few ways that I'm recommending that you begin to approach this idea. First of all, if you don't already know about the SDGs, definitely learn about them. They all come with a set of sub goals that you can easily access and read about, and they'll help you imagine more concretely how your work can uh, pertain to what they are. Then, as I was saying, consciously develop new language for the work that you do that resonates with the language of one or more of the SDGs. Find, uh, third of all, collect evidence that, your supports, that, that supports your claims about the social and ec economic effects of what you do. If you say that you have effects on the social development, the economic development of your community, you, you know it. We all know it to be true, but the case sometimes needs to be made in a sort of more verifiable way. So do whatever you can to collect this evidence and make it available accessible and powerful. And finally, be really open to seeking conversations and eventually seeking partnerships with, leadership, with leaders of government agencies, with NGOs, with corporate foundations. These are people you may never have felt allied with before, but they are in fact very powerful potential allies. Patrick, I'd love to invite your final comments as well. Yeah, yes. thank you, uh, Tricia. Yes, partnerships are very, very important. But um, again, it must be noted that, you know, partnerships shouldn't be developed for the sake of partnerships. They should be genuine uh, because there's plenty of free riding, misalignment of object objectives, lack of trust, and so forth. Yet they are badly needed because no single discipline can address the challenges we are facing today. And along those lines, consider these questions. How can arts educators link with the World Health Organizations, uh, ministries and agencies of public health in dealing with the coronavirus, for example? How can arts educators link with UNESCO and public and private agencies that run trade job creation, economic diversification, social development, inclusion, and so forth. As you think about those questions, we would also welcome your questions, and we want to thank you very, very much for your attention. I would like to thank you all for attending today's webinar, and especially thank Patrick and Tricia for being our fearless leaders. We wish you all a very happy International Arts Education Week and look forward to seeing you online throughout the week. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you.